Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, Amanda Moon from It's About Time serves up tropical edibles, including avocados, allspice, curry, and more. On tour, we head to San Antonio, where a couple traded a plain Jane yard for personality and fun. Daphne explains how to handle oak leaf drop and makes her pick of the week. Andrea de Longamaya tops things off with mulch. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. How do you transform a plain Jane yard into a garden full of personality and fun? In San Antonio, Ragna and Bob Hersey started with the path of imagination. Ragna and Bob Hersey didn't just want a garden, they wanted enchantment. All it took was some hard work, a clever eye for scavenges, a passion for hardy plants, and teamwork to fulfill their creative ideas. Their home in San Antonio had a typical yard until Ragna took over. Well, when we got here, there was nothing in the yard. I mean, it was wall to wall, St. Augustine, pretty dried up. The house had been vacant for about a year. Uh, the people here had really taken care of their St. Augustine. It was their main crop, I think. It, uh, they had a sprinkler system set up. So we had a blank, blank slate. There was no shrubs in the front, no tree in the front, <laughs> two trees in the backyard, and that's it. So I had fun, you know, just starting to design very slowly, adding flower beds, because I've always liked to garden. So I knew I was gonna do a lot with this, but I didn't know it would quite reach this point. Ragna turned a basic backyard of lackluster dimension into layers that summon pursuit. You know, I read a little piece of garden advice that I've always thought was very interesting, and it said, uh, find out what you can grow, and then grow a lot of it. Bob's very happy to take out the grass, less mowing. Bob built walkways to clarify each destination. In one bed, he built a rose trellis pyramid to play off Ragna's concrete one. One path leads to the secret garden. We found a little iron gate back there and the purple gate, and Bob built an arch and put the gate there. So that made, you know, that made a little different uh, area. And uh, like I said, the thing just kind of evolved. I, I don't know how it happened. I don't have any uh, training as a designer, but I do like art and I like to look and see how, you know, a pleasing, balanced look to everything. I love plants, I love being outside. To me, the garden is like an empty palette. It's like, an, it's an art form for me. So I'm always imagining, you know, how this would look and that would look. and. Really, in a way, it just kind of took on a life of its own. I would get a new plant or a new pot and walk around out there and think, now where would be the best place to plant this or to place this? And the yard, the garden just seems to tell me how to do it. It's just kind of evolved like that. She tucks in pots because they're easy to move around to suit the mood. Also, they're perfect for plants that want richer soil than her rocky caliche. With good potting soil, they hold their moisture. She rarely buys one. Instead, she gets them from friends, thrift stores, garage sales, and flea markets. If they lack enough drainage, she drills more holes. Her $5 finds at a washing machine repair shop already came with holes. This is the inside, the spinning part of the washing machine. And you know, they're quite large. What are they, 20 gallons or so? They have little tiny holes around them, which I think gives them a nice design but I did enclose the inside with heavy plastic to kind of keep in the moisture and keep the soil from running out and the roots from coming out the holes. Actually, they look very elegant. Ragna has a gift for turning any scavenge into art.
Well, I love mirrors. One time, one of my, I've got mirrors all over the house, and one of my little granddaughters decided to count the mirrors one time, and she went around and said, Nani, you have 65 mirrors in your house. But, of course, she was counting all the little mosaic designs and everything. So it makes a small space look larger. I just think it looks nice. So I have a lot of mirrors in the house, and, um, you know, I was watching flea markets. A friend of mine found this mirror, at a thrift store for five dollars and so she called me and said do you want it? I said yes so we put it up and I'd been saving these shells for like 30 years from the coast that the kids picked up the buckets of shells and so I glued the shells around it and uh, then I, I got the mirrors and uh, you know thrift stores and whatever that I have in the back and it's just a nice reflection, kind of a little surprise. You're walking along, you see something moving, and it's you in the mirror. <laughs> you know, little ideas pop up. And that's what's nice about gardening, is you can use them outside. Nobody cares what you do in your backyard. So to me, it's just like have fun. Just find something interesting, fun to do, cute things or whatever, you know, whatever you like. She repurposed cages, small and big, that once housed Indian fantail pigeons. They finally died off from old age. I think the last one died about two years ago. So we had the empty cage, so what to do with it? We moved to this house from a larger house. We had a lot of paintings, and so I had the bright idea to, okay, make a little art gallery out there. So now the pigeon loft is now my little art gallery. Ragna's garden tells a story of friends she's made in their mutual swap of ideas, accents, and plants. It's also a tribute to her first garden mentor. I have some of my grandmother's uh, plant stands, but she was a big influence on my love of gardening. Uh, the my happiest memories I have as a little kid playing in her yard on the south side of San Antonio. One thing that's different than her childhood, though, is that now she goes for the organic approach. I stopped spraying any kind of insecticides or fungicides or anything about five or six years ago. And I find now that um, the good bugs take care of the bad bugs. It's amazing. I really didn't believe it when I read that, you know, but I have a lot less pest problems since I stopped spraying any insecticides. And um, I let the wasps stay. I have a lot of butterfly plants. I do try to foster the butterflies. So there's a kind of a tension there because wasps do eat caterpillars, but they do eat a lot of harmful caterpillars. And who would want to harm the sweet little box turtles like Big Mama who wandered over one day to their forever home? In the front yard, after Bob took out the grass, she went for another look to express her creativity with a different style and plant collection. Front or back, Ragna's always in her garden, even when soaring temperatures send the bravest indoors. I mean, I love being outside so much. People will say, well, I can't go out in that heat, but I have a little secret. Actually, it was my mother's oh, idea. Yeah. Uh -huh. My little secret is you put crushed ice in a king-size pillow slip and pin it around your neck. And you can go out in 105 degrees and that ice drips down your back and work in relative comfort. It's good exercise. I work really hard. I'm not really one for exercise just for exercise. I like to see a product. Bob goes to the gym and I said, you just put all that effort in the <laughs> yard here. You know, uh, we could even do more. All right, thanks for sharing your garden with us. And up next, we're going to be talking about growing tropicals right here in Texas. A lot of people are beginning to do it from citruses and beyond, but we're going to be talking about some unusual things that uh, you would never have guessed can grow here in the Lone Star State. I'm joined by Amanda Moon from It's About Time Nursery. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. You know, Amanda, I've been looking around town for the past couple of years, and I've been seeing people be successful with plants we would never have dreamt of growing in the ground in Austin, uh, a lot of the citruses, for example, mm -hmm. in recent years. Uh, and uh, the times they are changing, aren't they? They are. We had a little bit of a hit three and four years ago that took out a couple of them. But, you know, we've had some rezoning here in mm -hmm. Central Texas where we've got some Zone 9s mm -hmm. cropping up now. 
right. in a little bit warmer areas. And so we're starting to push towards that 10 and 11 yeah. that we can get away with even growing the stuff outside. And for those who don't know 9, 10, and 11, we're talking about the, the USDA, coal hardening the zones, and we are moving steadily more tropical. We are. And uh, you have brought along a whole bunch of plants that are purely tropical, mm -hmm. but that you've been gardening with. I have been. Um, all of the plants that I brought today are edible in some form or another, mm -hmm. which means that you're also, I believe, using your water wisely mm -hmm. by putting it towards something that can be of benefit to you. <clears throat> and we should say that most of the plants that we're talking about today are plants that you grow in containers, right? I do, I do, mm -hmm. but there are places around town where many of these are actually in the ground. Okay, well let's start off by talking about uh, one that <coughs> in in the capital of Tex-Mex, Austin, Texas, yes. is we make a lot of people's ears perk up and that's the avocado. Yeah, I was actually referred to as the guacamole kid growing okay. up. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I, I, I love avocados, I've been eating them my entire life and uh, they've actually been grown in Texas for hundreds of years. Um, they're commercially produced down in the Rio Grande Valley, mm -hmm. and they are starting to develop varieties that actually are hardy down to 15, that wow. in some cases we could get away with in a protected location, mm -hmm. actually putting them in the ground. As long as we keep them pruned enough, uh, they want to grow 50 feet. Whoa. So the yes, <laughs> so the idea is no to keep, idea. Them, keep them down enough to where you still have your protection from your fences in your mm -hmm. house. Oh boy, a green avocado falling from 50 feet, beware. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, uh, this is something that uh, you can grow in containers, but uh, don't expect to grow uh, a fruiting avocado from the pit in a uh, grocery store. Exactly, uh, this is every kindergartner's dream project. Okay. Uh, most of us have done it. You take your little avocado pit, you put your toothpicks in, set it in water, you get your roots on the bottom, your green growth on the mm -hmm. top. And this is great as a project for kids, but you're never really gonna get a reliable plant that's gonna do much here. Really what we're aiming for is what we call the, the Mexican avocado okay. varieties. And those are Joey, Opal, Lila, um, mm. Poncho, Pryor, Wilma, fantastic. Okay. And so you wanna aim for something like that, you need two because okay, you want to so, get cross-pollination. Okay, pollination. Pollination, okay. And the reason is because the, the flowers, uh, the male flowers on the same plant open later in the day than the female flowers, and so you need two with opposite cycles huh, so that you can pollinate. Um, the one I brought today, uh, because our weather has been so warm, got confused, started blooming about six weeks early. It's been blooming since early December. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little yellow, just simply from the cold. I've had it outside most of the year. Um, the great thing about keeping them in containers is if we do get a hard snap, you can drag them in. Right, right. And the same is true for our next plant. Avocado, obviously, everybody knows about avocados, but the idea of growing cinnamon in yes. Central Texas is uh, really uh, unique and interesting. And I understand that uh, we're actually looking at the end product here in a sense. In a sense, yeah. Um, yeah. Cinnamon, I would say significantly harder to find mm -hmm. right. <laughs> as far as to, to buy and to grow. Uh, but this particular plant, uh, you grow it for a couple of years in a container, you lop it off all the way to the ground, and what it does is it forces it to sucker. And then those suckers, every other year you harvest, you, you beat them up a little bit, split the outer bark off of it, and it's that inner bark that creates the cinnamon. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, as the avocado, um, which I forgot to mention, you can actually use the leaves on the cinnamon in flavorings and teas. Interesting. Wow. And, and you know, it's in a, a handsome plant, actually, I think. I think it is. Yeah. And it smells oh. beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful fragrance. We were The crew was ooing and aahing over it and nice glossy foliage. The next plant you brought along is something called dragon fruit, and the plant looks like dragon fruit. <laughs> it does. It's, uh, it certainly has got a look that only a mother could love. Right. Um, but actually, uh, what I think is amazing about the story of dragon fruit is that it is a quintessential fruit that is used in Asian and Thai cooking and has been for hundreds of years. The, the kicker, though, is it's actually a Central American and Mexican plant okay. that was brought to them. And so we're not far from its native location. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it is a cactus. It is a vining cactus. Right. Looks <laughs> and looks like a, uh, a lot of the cirrus plants that we're familiar with, right? Exactly, exactly. It produces beautiful white flowers at mm -hmm. night uh, that smell wonderful. You're looking at fruit 30 to 60 days after flowering. Okay. 
This particular variety is called Voodoo Child. It's actually self-pollinating, so you don't have to worry about bats or moths in your greenhouse in order to get fruit. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, dragon fruit, again, is the name, and a uh, uh, really interesting looking plant uh, mm -hmm. as well. Right in front of it uh, is allspice, and yes. again, delightfully fragrant. It is, and actually the name allspice comes from the Europeans when they got a hold of it. They said, you know what, this actually smells like a combination of nutmeg, cloves, and cinnamon, so mm -hmm. hence allspice. Right. But it's under a Native America's plant. Mm -hmm. A uh, little bit cold hardy, you know, 25 to 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. You're probably okay with both of them. Um, you can use the leaves and tea. You can use the leaves and in, in anything you want to impart that allspice right. flavor. It's excellent used as barbecue wood. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're smoking a pork roast mm, or you know good. it's it's yeah. fantastic. We don't see a lot of the flowers and the the actual berries here because we're a little bit at least we have been right. a little bit too cold for it to bloom. Mm -hmm. Well, allspice again, and uh, related, I think, probably to a lot of American species, there are a lot of those real aromatic plants, mm -hmm. and uh, probably uh, some things like red bay, which grow here in, in Austin as well. Now we have the, you know, everybody hears about hibiscus tea, yes. and and here is the the source. This is one of them. It sure is, and this particular hibiscus is going to produce sort of inch and a half to two inch reddish purple flowers, mm -hmm. and they open. They're beautiful. As they close, you harvest them, you dry them, and that's what you can use to make hibiscus tea with. And it's a very attractive plant. It can be. If it's left to its own devices, it can get a little bit leggy. Yeah, so okay. you keep it pruned, keep it chopped, and keep it in a large container because it does have a tendency, like most hibiscus, to get root bound fairly quickly. Okay. All right. But the hibiscus teas are available as well. And uh, uh, I would imagine that this one is one that can do sun or shade. <laughs> It can, a little bit of afternoon shade in the summertime though, because you've got the little bit darker leaves, okay. you're gonna be a little bit better with. Okay, very good, all right. Uh, the gingers, uh, there are a lot of different forms of ginger people are growing. You have, you've brought two varieties. There are. Uh, cardamom ginger and... Galangal uh, ginger. Galangal, which is a, a staple in the Thai cooking. It is, it is. Uh, your cardamom ginger is the source of cardamom seed. Uh, here again, similar to the allspice, we don't get a lot of blooms on it, but here again, you can use the leaves as the cardamom fragrance, the cardamom scent. The galangal ginger, a little bit stronger than your regular ginger, can be grown in the ground in a protected location. The cardamom needs to be in a container. Galangal is a little bit sturdier, okay. and you just let it go dry when it goes dormant in the wintertime. You don't want to water wet rhizomes, or you don't want to wet rhizomes. <laughs> right, right. It, they're real easy to rot. The same goes for regular ginger. Mm -hmm. You want to get them started from the root. You want to make sure that you buy them from a nursery or from an organic source that they don't have a growth inhibitor put on them. Okay, all right. But there, there are a couple of the gingers, and uh, v again, very popular in, in local cuisine. The next plant is curry tree, and mm -hmm. I never knew there was such a thing as curry tree. There is. Um, there is a difference. Curry powder, of course, is a combination of different herbs and spices. Curry plant is uh, related to sunflowers. It's a helichrysum. can be used like rosemary. This particular one is curry leaf or curry tree. This is the true source of curry, the, the, the spice that's used in Indian cooking. And you use the leaves fresh make a poultice, you can fry them, you can do different ways to, to use them, mm -hmm. uh, depending on your traditional methods. Um, it's fairly cold tolerant here. I've seen one survive in Pflugerville in a protected location. Can be a little bit invasive. It will spread by suckering and by the seed. All right, so beware. <laughs> beware, yeah. A little bit of afternoon shade. Okay. All right. Um, when I hear invasive, my ears always perk up. But, uh, <laughs> Amanda, we're going to have to wrap it up on that right. note. But thank you for this introduction to all these really cool plants. Oh, and I welcome. know that a lot of the people here in Austin who have culinary inclinations will probably be very interested in this. So thanks again for being our guest. Thank you. All right. And coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our question this week comes from viewer Robin Mayfield, who's curious if it's okay to put mulch on top of the live oak leaves that have fallen into her garden beds, rather than wake them up. She usually removes them, since she's heard that they don't break down easily. Well, Robin, I'd say that leaving them is just fine. You're correct that live oak leaves don't break down easily, but that's okay if they're serving as mulch. My only caution is regarding the possibility of overwintering insects. If you noticed any sort of prolific insect infestation last year, such as caterpillars, I'd suggest removing the leaf litter and either composting it or recycling it curbside. 
But if you didn't have any problems last year, it's not likely that any overwintering insects that may be hiding in your leaf litter will pose enough of a problem to worry about, especially since our winter was so dry. I also got quite a few questions this winter about live oaks losing their leaves incredibly early this year, and whether this was due to the very early arrival of spring-like temperatures. Everyone's live oaks were looking especially healthy at the time, so there was a real concern about climate change. But the unseasonably warm temperatures were not to blame, at least not as they reflect the seasons. The early defoliation seen in otherwise healthy live oaks, it's not out of the ordinary. There are many things that could cause senescence and shedding of leaves, but our recent drought seasons have certainly played a leading role. This may seem counterintuitive since the trees appear to be in excellent condition and not at all drought stressed. But after many weeks without rain, even a healthy tree begins to prepare for a possibly bleak future. Leaves require water to support, and if there's no water in sight, many trees will drop their leaves and go into dormancy until the stressful situation passes. Other factors causing early defoliation include insects, such as mites, aphids, centipede wasps, etc., and disease, such as rust, tar spot, and other fungal leaf spots. Healthy trees should tolerate these problems and recover from them pretty easily. Our plant this week is Mexican Tithonia, Tithonia rotundifolia, also known as Mexican sunflower. This sweet little sunflower relative makes a great addition to any sunny garden bed. It thrives in our central Texas heat, but does need a little supplemental irrigation at the hottest, driest times of year. Be sure not to overwater, especially if you have clay soil. And don't be fooled by its small stature when purchased. Tithonia can get up to six feet tall and four feet wide, although dwarf varieties are available. The leaves are rather coarse textured and fuzzy, and the plant will be covered in orange flowers all summer long. If you shear the plant regularly, but lightly, to remove the spent blooms, it will flower even more prolifically. Tithonia is an annual and can be planted in spring from either seeds or transplants. Since it does get so tall, be sure to put this plant in the back of your garden bed to highlight smaller perennials or ground covers. Tithonia is irresistible to butterflies, so this plant should be a must-have in any wildlife garden. To do in your garden this week, plant warm season vegetables like peppers, tomatoes, squash, and beans. And also, plant any summer perennials and annual flowers. If you're interested in learning more about gardening in Central Texas, I'd like to remind you about Extension's fabulous workshops and programs that we offer. Visit travis-tx.tamu.edu for more information. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plans of the week from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Andrea DeLong Amaya for Backyard Basics. So as gardeners, we have a huge choice of different kinds of mulches to use in our garden, and sometimes it can be overwhelming to try to figure out what is the best thing to use in your landscape. So I want to talk about a few different options that we have today. Um, a mulch is basically a ground cover or material that covers the soil that can do a number of different things. Uh, it can help regulate the soil temperature, keep the roots of the plants cooler in the summer and keep them maybe a little bit insulated and warmer in the winter time. It also can help with soil erosion, uh, inhibiting weed seeds, that sort of thing. They do a lot of things. Also, you can use them just to pr promote a certain kind of aesthetic in your garden. For example, if you have a succulent garden, you might want to use a pea gravel or something. Um, so I have several categories that I've broken them down into, and I think of mineral mulches as one. Then we also have organic mulches, which is a, a plant-based um, mulch that you can use. And then finally, we have living mulches, which I would consider using um, just plants as an actual mulch. So I have some samples here that we can look at. Um, one of the most basic ones is just plain compost. And you want to make sure that you have a good, well-composted compost that you're going to use uh, on top of your garden beds. If it's not composted well enough, then you can have certain problems with, um, with nutrients and uh, it's really best if you have it already well composted. It's really good if you're trying to enrich your soils over time. Uh, you have to apply it more frequently than you might other mulches. Another one that's commonly used is the shredded mulch. Um, and this is just uh, out of the chipper. It's fairly coarse. You can get them in different, um, different varieties, different uh, textures. But a shredded mulch is good. It has kind of a, a weave that you, um, as those fibers weave together, and it creates a mat. And that has some advantages and disadvantages. It's really good for keeping weeds down, but it also can make a mat that uh, makes it hard for the water to penetrate through. So it might be ideal if you have it on top of um, like a drip irrigation system or soaker hoses. 
One of my favorites is the, uh, the pecan shell mulch. It's a local material. Um, one of my favorite things is when you get a nice pile of it, you can get uh, squirrels digging through it. Like, I know there's a nut in here somewhere and it drives them crazy. But in the garden, it's really great too because these pieces are concave and so they kind of lock together so they don't migrate around in your bed so much. They have a nice dark color. It's a really nice organic mulch. Now the other category that I mentioned is mineral mulches, and mineral mulches are really good if you have plants like a lot of our Central Texas native plants that really like it dry. Uh, the mineral mulches keep the humidity level lower, it helps wick away moisture from the bases of the plants. And so some examples that I have here is just um, like a limestone sand which is a little bit coarser than road base, but it kind of is essentially the same thing. It has a light color. It can be very reflective, so that might be a little bright. Um, the decomposed granite is another one that's very commonly used, and that's a really good um, option that's not quite as bright as the limestone. Pea gravel, you can get it also in different sizes. This is an excellent um, mulch. And then finally, we have the crushed glass, and this is actually a recycled product from the city of Austin. Um, the other category that I mentioned are plants, and you can use any kind of plant that has um, a nice mat to it. Plants that will sucker or have uh, roots at the nodes are really good for uh, helping with erosion control, but it, they do the same thing. They keep the soil temperature regulated, um, they look nice, they can help with um, temperature fluctuations, and a lot of the same things that these other mulches have. So for Backyard Basics, this is Andrea DeLongamaya. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and like us on Facebook. Next week, check out Homegrown Citrus. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.